Uh, ladies and gentlemen, we are now on to the last session uh, of this terrific day. And uh, you have all heard our uh, various speakers on this panel present individually. But this is going to be an opportunity for us to have a discussion, uh, to see which one of them has the best crystal ball, uh, to mix it up a little bit, and maybe try to get even some competing ideas around this term uh, that Vanessa did a fairly good uh, and clinical job of dismantling uh, sustainable fashion. Um, I think we've had today uh, a really extraordinary set of sessions which combined uh, both uh, inspiring stories, uh, honest assessments, and some genuine commitments uh, among, among all the stakeholders uh, that the Crown Princess this morning uh, talked about are so critical to pushing this uh, agenda forward. The minister this morning, uh, Vestaya, said something that in a way sounded obvious that fashion is trendsetting. But there's a larger point here that's, I think, just worth noting for a second, which is that this discussion that's taking place here is taking place at a time of some fairly large uh, global shifts that are taking place. And they are very much shifts that are going to impact this question. One is, uh, what kind of capitalism are we going to have going forward that does sustain growth, but without extreme inequality, of the kind we've seen, obviously, in Bangladesh, but now see around a lot of the world? What kind of globalization are we going to see that's going to mirror, uh, in a more reflective and a more uh, appropriate way, the much wider divergence of capital, of ideas, of modes, and norms of governance that's going to take place in the 21st century? And finally, what's going to be the relationship of power uh, between stakeholders of all kinds, CEOs and shareholders, uh, customers and manufacturers, and citizens and governments? So these are all three questions that are taking place and are being transformed at this very moment that fashion and sustainability is going through its own important transition as well. For this discussion, what we're going to do is we're going to ask uh, each of our panelists to reflect on one particular dimension of their issue, uh, and then we're going to have a little bit of a game at the end of it that I hope will be entertaining for all of you. Uh, what we're going to do now is start with Livia. Uh, and Livia, as all of you know, has been at the forefront of bringing ethics to aesthetics, as she very ele elegantly puts it. Um, but last night at dinner, she said that she is uh, thinking about a new battle. And uh, without giving anything away, maybe, Livia, you could tell us a bit about what that battle is going to be about. Well, is this working? Sure. No? Yeah, now it is. Well, you know, I have it on my Twitter profile that I'm a professional agitator. And, you know, one of the things that I've been, that I can never, ever really come to terms with is that if fast fashion didn't exist, we wouldn't need to have a summit in Copenhagen to try and clean the mess of environmental destruction, social justice destruction that it has been caused in the last 15 to 20 years of its existence. And so it, the bar, it's not a really a battle, but it's more like a, a, a call to action to be active citizenship, citizen to talk about, to really think about what are the consequences when you're buying something. We, you know, before in my presentation, I talked a lot about the real people at the other end, which are completely removed from our thoughts. Um, it needed a disaster, or as Nazma called it, a murder, like Rana Plaza, to really make some, you know, think about it and reveal that there are people on the other end of the supply chain. And, you know, if you take it, I never separated environmental justice from social justice. And if you take fast fashion from the environmental perspective, you can use as much organic cotton as you want, but you're still creating a huge pile of rubbish, organic cotton rubbish. Because the average garment stays in each one of, of our wardrobes for um, five weeks. And this, you know, I've been based this on studies, I'm not making it up now. On the point of view of social justice, for the government workers, it will never work. Because, as I said before, fast fashion wants to produce fast. So the government worker has to produce faster and cheap. So the government worker is the only point of the supply chain where the margin are squeezed. And you have this huge 
you know, companies going to the factory in Bangladesh place an order for 1.5 million jeans for, you know, 30 cents each, 50 cents each. How can you make it ethical? I don't know. But also from the consumer point of view, is it really democratic to buy a T-shirt for $5, a pair of jeans for $20? Or are they taking us for a ride? Because they're making us believe that we are rich or wealthy because we can buy a lot. But in fact, it's, they're making us poorer. And the only person who is becoming richer is the owner of the fast fashion brand. So that makes me a little bit angry. It's true. And you, and you, when you said, uh, when you said last night, night that you had a battle you wanted to talk about, this would be <laughs> a, uh, an agitator's battle. So thank you, thank you for that, Livia. I'm sure we'll come back to it, and very much hoping this will be a conversation among the group. Alan, if we could go to you, uh, a very, very powerful movie and, and discussion that you just led. But help us, and, and this is obviously picking up on, on uh, Livia's point very much. You know, Marco from Boteco Veneta talked very much about the solution to this problem has to come through and with business rather than against them. Uh, which, again, sounds right, uh, sounds uh, ideal, sounds uh, the kind of thing that we would all wish for. But help us, again, really in the spirit of, of Livia, I think put a little bit more pressure on the contending interests here, right? The real comp competing interests here. Given the fact that every large brand was perfectly aware of the conditions at Rana Plaza and the Rana Plazas of the world the day before the accident, what is it that should give people a sense that something really has changed now? And can it really change, given that they're still selling T-shirts for $2.99 or $1.99? Okay, I think there were nine questions there, so I might That's try okay. and answer a couple of them. Um, I'm not sure how much time we've got. I think one thing to put in perspective, that the Rana Plaza disaster um, could well have happened before. Clearly, all of the voluntary um, multi-stakeholder initiatives and the initiatives of the brands themselves around factory inspections never took the consideration of structural integrity into account. And it took a disaster such as Rana Plaza to actually focus people's attention to the dubious building standards in Bangladesh. That is just the facts. Mm -hmm. I think the role of business is very clear, and the accord has actually, you know, if you like, hit a chord here with industry that says, you are obligated, you are obliged to actually do something about this challenge. And by creating a legally binding um, scenario that commits people to the long term to a, a, a market such as Bangladesh is absolutely fundamental. That they're there for the long term, they aren't, it's, we talk about fast fashion, and fast fashion, people seem to think fast fashion says, well, we can move from source to source, move from market to market, just like that. Actually, the more effective brands out there who turn around their ranges very quickly actually have stayed with their suppliers in quite a long time. And they're, doing, they're working with them on a close basis to actually be more productive, to create that flexibility. Are they paying enough for the products? No, they're not. I think that's a very fair challenge. But I think, and the example we had just earlier before the Rana Plaza film of the, the total cost of a product and the retail price. Industry has an absolute role to play and a responsibility to ensure that they're not exploiting anybody in the supply chain in any way, shape, or form. Um, but I think to turn around clearly <clears throat> and, and say that it is the absolute responsibility of the brands, no, it's not. There's a role for government here. And we could look at it from a Bangladesh perspective and say, Bangladesh, written on paper, has some very fundamentally good laws. They've never been implemented, they've never been monitored, and the resource is not there within the government to actually make it work. So I think there's a, there's a joint lobbying and challenge, if you like, not only to industry, but also to government, to stand up and be counted and recognize that change has to happen. Because what we can't have is another one of these disasters. And I don't think that answers all or nine of your questions, but I can't no, remember right. all of them. That's right. But, but you know, obviously the point on the government question in a place like Bangladesh is that a lot of the large brands are precisely relying on the fact that the government isn't able to implement and enforce its laws to be able to produce very cheaply. I mean, we, can, we can come back to that. Um, Helena, not just because you're in the middle of the stage, but uh, obviously you are uh, representing H&M, which uh, has done some terrific uh, work in this space. But at the end of the day, uh, in London last week, on the side of a bus, I saw an ad for a skirt for $5.99. And I remember thinking, not in the context today, how is that possible? And to this point that we're talking about, how do you, you know, because we understand that, yes, are the, a lot of the people that you employ in these places better off in those jobs than they would otherwise be? Sure. 
But in this broader context, in the broader consciousness context that you're talking about, how do you try to address some of the questions that Olivia raises and, and we've talked about here? Yeah. Because at the end of the day, this is a brand that relies on lots of people buying lots of stuff all the time, a little bit like yeah. uh, Vanessa was talking about. Let me touch upon different things, and I kind of feel that I need to respond a little bit to your comments, Livia, also. Uh, I mean, we want to make it possible to combine this, because we're super proud of being able to offer a more sustainable fashion in Chile, in the Philippines, in India, and so forth. Uh, and I must say that when I see, go into an H&M store and I see labels made in Bangladesh, I feel super proud. And I know that there's challenges still. We're not perfect. Uh, but I know that our presence in Bangladesh is really something good, especially for the women in that country. I've been living in Bangladesh myself uh, for two years. And we have an office of 420 people in Dhaka. So for us, the factory workers are super central to our business. Uh, maybe that's not the case for all stakeholders, but for us, there are a, they are a tremendous, important uh, resource. So when it comes to social issues, mm -hmm. I would say that we know that our presence in these countries is contributing to positive change. And that we can see through our way of measuring uh, different things and compliance of the code of conduct. But we can also go to the World Bank and look at figures like 2021, uh, Bangladesh will most probably be classified as a middle income uh, country. However, there are still a lot of challenges to deal with. I showed you the roadmap on fair living wages. So, of course, we feel that we have a lot of things to drive and to show that this is actually possible. Because I would say that it's more about size of a company. H&M has that size that we can meet prime minister and we can drive change at the factory floors, but also when it comes to influencing governments. Then when it comes to the planetary boundaries, I mean, the proof is here. Uh, and and when it comes to environmental issues, it's nothing Of course, we need to change business models. I mean, the way fashion has been produced and consumed has changed over the years. It has to continue to change, and we need to do major changes. For H&M, that means that we're focusing a lot, a lot on circular economy, meaning that the garments that we bring in, we need to try to do new garments of that and be less dependent on natural resources. So I think all big brands really have to look into their business models and see whatever we can change. Thank you, thank you. I'm, I'm sure what we'll try to do is have a little bit of discussion on, on the points that yeah, you made. Yeah. But let me, let me ask uh, Jason to, to, to address one dimension of this, which we've talked about in some ways today, but I was recently with a, a senior executive from a very big uh, energy company. And she said to me, talking about the shale gas and shale oil revolutions in the United States, she said, you know, the one thing we're never going to run out of is technology. And she meant, obviously, the way technology has transformed uh, the energy industry. What is the role technology can play? Obviously, technology has had a big part in creating the underlying structural change that made fast fashion possible, that has made the kind of uh, environmental uh, impact possible and has created it. But where is technology's role in actually solving a lot of these issues? That's a great question. Um, I, I, if I may tell kind of a ridiculous story that maybe changed my thinking on this. It's the end of the day, so that's okay. So uh, I, I brought a friend of mine, Nigel Topping, who is the executive director of Carbon Disclosure Project, or CDP, to a terrible restaurant in San Francisco, and there were literally cockroaches falling from the ceiling uh, onto, our, onto our table, and Nigel didn't ditch me at this point. But then we went back to our office, and it happened to be a day when we both had a free day, which never seems to happen. And we started drawing up a vision of what we, we thought could be open data, because what we both saw is that from the HIG index or from CDP, from so many sources, there's just a vast amount of data collected. But it's not moving in smart places. It's not actually going to create this level of transparency that we hoped. 
So Nigel and I drew this great map, and they were like, we're going to form the Open Data Coalition. And Nigel's like, no, no, we're going to have fun. We're going to call it the Forces of Light. And then we got so excited about the Forces of Light that we marched over to Good Guide, which makes a, an app for, for rating products. And we said, Dara, are you, are you going to be in the Forces of Light? And he said, I'm in, I'm in. So we continued this march just with an idea that there needs to be a, a way for all of the sustainability data to be shared, to be open, to eventually re reach the places where it can make a change. And I think in talking to lots of other people that collect data or that are thinking about data long term, I think that we're going to see a world where the data behind products flows very, very freely. Uh, I've, I've been asked probably 10 questions today about when is a label coming out. And uh, Helena might ask me another question about when a, when a label is coming out. But I don't know that a label is the future. I think the future is actually in freeing this data on open platforms where third parties can actually rate it and review it themselves. I mean, it would be a wonderful world when Livia could have her own rating system or perhaps H&M could as well and Greenpeace could as well. And so that trusted third parties could actually take the underlying data that's related to these products and do something meaningful with it, make meaningful judgments. So I believe, if I am going to make a, a prediction, I think it's going to be that the data for all products will be free so that we will know where that product was made, what were the conditions of the workers, not just from a third party auditor, but from those workers themselves, yeah. punching in on cell phones, what are the impacts of the materials, how much carbon is ca caused by that product, and then after that product is, it has gone through one end of life, how do, who do, who's holding it in its second life? What does it become in its third life? I think that is the kind of world that we need to see where technology and open data flows very freely and actually transforms this so that we can actually build technological innovation on sustainability information to see the change that we really want. And that kind of technology actually exists in, in some industries that are very high intensive in terms of security and safety. The oil industry and platforms you know where every person on the platform is at any time when they clock in and out. Um, so it's interesting. Uh, Vanessa, you're, you're sitting between Livia and Helena, uh, and you also uh, came here, perhaps not, that wasn't your mission, but you did come and, and put it a little bit to the whole group, the, the whole concept that we're talking about, uh, maybe both wrong and, and certainly, uh, as you put it, uh, not, not sustainable. Uh, I'm curious both about whether anything today that you heard changed your sense of the idea of thinking much more as about a wardrobe rather than fashion, uh, either today or on this panel, but also maybe with your uh, critic's hat on, uh, thinking, listening to Livia and listening to Helena, what are the questions that are raised in your mind about how they think about it? So what would you say to each of them about the way they are trying to argue their case? Because there is clearly a debate here. Um, <laughs> Let me do the other part of the question first. Okay. <laughs> and in terms of um, what I've learned or you know, what, I, what I saw, I think the first thing is that we still don't know what sustainability means when we talk about it in terms of, you know, in this context. You know, I still think people don't bother to define that word. They just use it. And that does lead to kind of fuzziness and people coming at the same subject from different angles, which may actually be what's going on, you know, with Helena and Livia. Because we're talking about the same subject, but, you know, really, Helena's talking about what can a business that already exists do to make itself better and to make it the conditions of its workers better, whereas Livia is really saying shouldn't shouldn't exist, you know, this shouldn't happen this way, you know. And I think that's part of the the fuzziness here. Um, but before we get to the ideal world that Jason described, which would be very nice, where we can all scan a label um, and find out everything about our garment and how it was made. Uh, which actually semi-exists on a website um, that Bernard Velha, that, that was done called, um, oh God, sorry, I forget what it was called. Okay, you can, <laughs> um, you can remember it later and we'll send you around. Spy? Honest Buy, Honest Buy, Honest Buy, which if anyone here has not seen, you should absolutely go to, Great. because you can click on a garment and get all the information that, about every part of it, and, um, and also how much the markup is and where that money is going. Um, it's, it's Bruno Peters. Bruno Peters. It's, it's, re it's a fantastic, revolutionary website, and everyone should do it. Um, but no one else has thus far, which is maybe interesting in itself. You know, but before 
we reach a world where that exists. What has been really encouraging to me is what Jason is doing with the Hig Index and what's happening with um, Clever Care. Mm -hmm. You know, in that it is a kind of language, you know, a visual language, symbolic language, you know, that represents things that consumers can look at and ideally learn that will communicate to them what's going on with their garments. And that, I think, is incredibly valuable and really is the next step and should be the next step. You know, you need to make things incredibly simple for people. You know, most, most of us do not want to go research, you know, online and afterwards yeah. the providence of our garments. We just don't have the time. But if it's there, when you buy something, you'd be much more likely to care about it and to pay attention to it. And to me, that's the kind of the easiest next step and the most important next step. Okay. I'm just curious, I mean, Olivia, when, when you're listening to that and you're thinking, and maybe realistically, probably, if you look at businesses the size of H&M or Zara uh, and the enormous financial and economic success they've had, the incentives for business like that, businesses like that to really change what they've done, which has succeeded the way it has, are, uh, I think, complex, to put, it, to put it mildly. Do you think the solution will come, then, ultimately, from this kind of consumer-driven change, that this kind of information will make consumers not just look at it from time to time, but really change buying habits, buy less, buy better, yeah. uh, buy more uh, informed. Well, is that really where it's going to come from, and how long will that take? Well, it can take very little when companies, first of all, it can also come from the H&M, Zara, or, you know, do you really need to produce so many collections a year? Could you, call, you know, you can produce, Vanessa talked about how the pressure of designers um, to produce to create six collections a year, eight collections a year. How many collections do you produce? 60? A lot. Every two weeks, there is a new style in, in a you know, fast fashion brand shop. So the, you know, the business could decide today to change that, to put an end to how many styles, how many seasons they produce. So the consumer, they win the consumer. It's like. It, 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 it makes me smile when brand says, well, but the consumer wants it. Well, you know what? My children want sugar every day, all the time. And if they, <laughs> what do I do? So we are playing a game of, you know, throwing the responsibility into someone else's. Um, it, the responsibility la lays in all of us. The business has to lead. And when the business wants to make, you know, they invest a lot of money in different things. They should invest money into this, you know, changing, trying to figure out a new business model. I'm not an economist and I don't know, I don't own H&M, so I don't know what is that solution, but there must be a business model that works the same. Um, without, you know, depleting the environment and um, making slaves of the garment workers. Um, you know, you talked about the roadmap that you, um, and again, it's admirable to try to change things, but as, you know, Nadir said, you, you have, and also you said you've been in Bangladesh for a long time, and it, it took Rana Plaza to make H&M react. Um, and also, you know, there is this, com you, you spoke about a commitment to try and, and promise a, a, how did you call it? A, a, a basic living wage. What does that mean? Uh, how do you define a fair living wage in Bangladesh? You know, um, what does that mean? And I have a pilot project in three factories, and by 2018, 15% of your factories are gonna have that. It's not good enough, it's not. I'm sorry. So let's, let's before, before we go to the last uh, <laughs> part of the, the session, I think in fairness to, to Helena, we'll give you a chance to, to respond uh, maybe in a, couple, in a minute or so, and then we'll go to the next part of the session. Yeah. I think that when it comes to the fair living wage roadmap, we, we can maybe discuss that in detail because it's very clear for us that what a living wage is, is something that the workers should say. 
and that's incorporated that's incorporated in our way of working. How much is uh, it? And that's not for us to say a sum, but we do an assessment all the time. How much uh, is it? To make sure that it covers the basic needs of the workers. So it's, I, I can show you that later on. Uh, and the other question, no. I forgot in the way of that's the right, fair that's wage right. If there was any, anything else you wanted to say on this before the, we go. You said something else about um, before that. Can you help me? Whether you needed to do as many collections? Yeah, yeah. Many collections. collections. Thank you. Uh, I don't have the number in my head, but I know that also fashion in that sense is really changing. It used to be about trends that went away and then new trends came along. Today, fashion is much more about your personal style, meaning that you combine garments from different trends. And for us, that could mean or should mean that it's, the garments are more durable. And that is, of course, something that we want to encourage in different ways. So for us, again, I think it's about um, both making the customers more aware and kind of work even more to get the personal style as something important because that will also be more sustainable. But also, of course, uh, to make sure what we're talking about business models. And I think that is not really a big debate when it comes to the planetary boundaries. I think that we have so much proof on that. So, again, of course, that needs to change. And that, I guess, different companies are doing in different ways. And again, we're, we're working a lot and pu putting efforts on innovation to work more with circular uh, economy and closing the loop of textile fibers as one way. Okay, thank you. I'm not sure if I responded no. to thank everything. Thank you, thank you very much. Yeah. So what we're gonna do uh, at the end here, uh, since this is a session about the future of fashion, um, I've asked, uh, and I only gave them one minute's notice before we came out on the stage, uh, for each of the panelists to think six years out, and if we're sitting here in 2020, uh, give us a prediction uh, of an issue that will be very much on everyone's minds in 2020, which we're not really thinking about now. So as I say, uh, with a very unfair one minute uh, advance notice, uh, and since Vanessa's a professional at this, she goes first. What do you mean? <laughs> um, my, my, I have a hope that I think my, I hope is a prediction, um, which is that actually in six years' time, we're not sitting here talking about this, that this subject, I mean, I hope we're sitting here, but talking about something else maybe, uh, you know, that this subject really becomes a part of every conversation held all the time just by the by, you know, the same way we talk about the weather, the same way we talk about, like, what's cool or what song is in, that you know, the sustainable aspect or the environmental aspect or the moral aspect of fashion simply becomes a part of every conversation about fashion. Doesn't matter where. Great, thank you. Alan. Well, that's rather, sorry, that's rather stolen my thunder because I was gonna say I hope in six years time we're not even talking about the word sustainability, that it has become part of the day job in everything we do and that's across the entire spectrum, not just from a product sustainability, but from a, a social sustainability point of view as well. And I, I suppose, again, I was gonna pick up Vanessa and say, hope is not a strategy. Um, it was, it was a, some guru threw that at me the other week, and I thought, actually, that's quite a good statement. But I would hope that in 2020, the consumers know where their product is made, and they're asking informed, challenging questions of retailers and brands about the provenance of the goods, how they were made, the conditions under which people are operating, and asking the questions about, are you still exploiting people? Because if you are, it needs to stop. That's a bit of a hope, I think, but not a strategy. Okay, Livia? Well, I echo what Vanessa um, yeah. I'm, said. I'm, I'm about to say, you, you, you but, do have to pick one each. No, no, <laughs> but um, what it would be really nice is to organize a conference uh, a summit be here again to talk about trade regulations because one of the things that is never talked about and is a huge, huge cause of the sustainability issues, social justice issues, is trade regulations. 
And there have been trade talks organized by the WTO, by you name it. They've, they've tried, tried to do it for many, many years, and nothing has ever happened. And maybe it's up to the fashion industry to pick it up and try and, you know, understand why, you know, cotton is farmed in Africa, shipped to China to be processed and send it back to Africa to be dyed and produced in Bangladesh as a garment. So how can we regulate markets so that the environmental and social justice issues are taken care of? Great. Thank you. Helena. I also remember what I wanted to respond to, but I can bring that into the answer. Uh, yeah, in so, some way, so I think. It's a, a, a prediction. <laughs> yeah. So in um, six years, in what, six what do you think years, we'll be talking about? Of course, I hope that brands like H&M have created a lot of trust with showing even more results. Because when I hear that uh, Rana Plaza made us act, of course, I get very sad since we've had a sustainability program uh, since the 90s and been very active and we weren't part of that accident. Uh, so I would hope that we have created a lot of results and trust into what we're doing. But also I think that, I echo you a little bit, that I think business integration will be very, it will be natural. M maybe even that the audience will, I like you a lot, don't get me wrong, the audience is great. But I think that maybe it will be a little bit different in six years' time. Maybe we can see CFOs here or we can see buying managers or... Um, different kind of people, because it's so natural to build into the different businesses. So a broader constituency yeah. around these issues. Yeah. Okay, great. Thank you. Um, Jason, you get the last word, and much as, much as it's been great to hear people's hopes, uh, I'm not letting you off the hook on that. So no hopes, but an actual prediction that we, we will hold you to. So if this is an actual prediction, and I get to be a little bit gloomy, uh, I will actually say that uh, my prediction is that transparency will be actually achieved, that we will have Gloomy. radical, hold on, radical transparency in, in the supply chain, but that consumers and businesses will all be wrestling with what that means, and consumers will actually look at themselves and be making harder choices instead of pushing some of these things to the brands or the conversation often goes, this is bad, that, that's the other, but actually recognizing their role as an actor in the system and being a, a positive agent for change. Okay, terrific. Um, well, look, I think this has been a, a, a great, actually, closing uh, debate and conversation. It's brought to light a lot of the issues that have been raised during the day um, in a very, very powerful and, I think, um, educational way for all of us. So if you would please uh, join me in thanking the panel.